Hi, and welcome to the third installment of our webinar series, Gardening for Beginners. My name is Jan Welsh, and I'm a Master Gardener volunteer in Anoka County. Before I start the show, a little reminder about the mission of the Master Gardeners. The University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Program uses research-based horticultural knowledge and practices to deliver educational outreach and project-based efforts that inspire change and promote healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy planet. This slide features the priorities of our program. If you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, you can check out the Anoka County Master Gardener webpage for more information. So to recap, last time on Gardening for Beginners, we started with part one, preparing for a spring garden. We talked about tools, choosing the site, planning for critters, all that good stuff. And in part two, let's go with the garden, preparing the site, cool versus warm season crops, seedlings, and so on. If you didn't get a chance to tune in the first time, the recordings are available on YouTube and they're linked above. In today's session, we're gonna talk about managing your garden for success. There's a lot happening out there in the garden right now, so let's get started. Dirt. We hope you've taken advantage of a soil test for your garden and you've received the results back from the University of Minnesota Extension Service with recommendations of what's needed for your specific garden. If not, you can have a soil test done anytime the ground isn't frozen. That's typically helpful. Um, designate walking paths or lanes in your garden. This avoids compaction of the soil. Growing up, we were raised, we raised all the vegetables um, for our family. We had a very big vegetable garden and us kids all worked in the garden all summer long. And I still remember the narrow boards my dad placed between each row in that garden. They were four inches wide. We could not step off the boards because he didn't want us stepping anywhere close to the, the rows where the produce was being grown. Um, in my garden today, um, we've had a lot of trees taken down. So I asked the tree service to cut a lot of big round tree cookies. I use those as steps in my perennial gardens. I also rely on a lot of our leftover shavings from projects in our wood shop. And those make really nice paths as well um, between my vegetable rows. Mulch is just such a critical feature of gardening. It protects your topsoil from erosion, especially if you have hillsides or steep banks. Um, it prevents splashing of soil particles onto leaves and stems, which helps reduce the occurrence of diseases. Tomato blight is a good example. You wanna always mulch around the base of your tomatoes to prevent that splash up from occurring. And I think most importantly, it minimizes weeds. In my experience, a good layer of mulch works so well. You can often skip using products like landscape fabric. My house came with a very large perennial bed in the front yard um, planted with landscape fabric and the roots from a dozen Siberian iris have created an impenetrable shield that I cannot get my sharpest spade to go through. And I've tried for about three years to dig this patch up. Um, it's really turned out to be a headache. I wish they would have just initially gone with a nice four inch layer of mulch. Cleanliness is vital in the garden. After working in the garden, um, I give my tools a spritz. I have a, a little spray bottle, 10% bleach, and I just give my tools. Um, uh, a little spritz of that keeps them clean. I also wipe all the dirt off of my trowels, um, shovels, other tools before I put them away. Um, I have boot brushes by um, all my entrances to the house and but also all the hardscapes. So if I'm going from garden to garden, I stop and I clean the bottoms of my shoes off. And I have a enormous pile of slip on garden shoes by the back door. Um, that I usually have to wrestle away from the puppy, but um, those work very handy for coming in and out and keeping, they're easy to keep clean. 
Keep an eye out for the latest invasive species. Our jumping worms have uh, invaded Anoka County. Um, they are as icky as they sound. And so far, no real control measures yet, but uh, keep posted on wormwatch.org. Um, you'll get some of the latest updates on what's happening with those. And finally, while most bugs are very beneficial, um, there are lots of bugs that will ruin your day and your plants. I found dogwood sawfly larva devouring my red twig dogwoods this spring and only because I have a practice of walking around my yard usually once a day and picking up stems and branches and bending them over and look at the undersides of the leaves. And that's where I first found those larvae. They look like they're coated in powdered sugar and they had just started devouring the foliage. They would have defoliated those shrubs in a day or two. So it was a lucky thing that I caught them in time. Other ways to prevent disease, um, using drip irrigation or carefully hand watering to avoid water splashing up onto the leaves um, is very helpful. Using mulch, straw, bark, plastic, um, whatever you can underneath your plants just to prevent those pathog pathogens from splashing up from the ground. Like many of you, my yard came with an above ground irrigation, which is not ideal but I make sure to run it in the very early morning so those plants have a long time during the daytime to get fully dried off before nighttime. We have a couple of links listed here. Uh, when using the first link, Ask a Master Gardener, um, you can attach up to three photos with your question, which is really helpful. And the second, what's wrong with my plant? It gives you an easy to navigate flow chart helps you figure out what your plant's problem is and how to remedy it. You've worked so hard to get to this point and some animal has ruined your plants. Um, hopefully you did some initial fencing to protect your garden when you installed it this spring, but if not, and you found out your plants have been chomped, all is not lost. It's happened to all of us. Step one, you need to figure out who the culprit is. Rabbits typically make a clean cut to the foliage and uh, deer have a more ragged look when they break off a stem. Do you see the offender in action? Do you see, um, usually you can see deer tracks um, if they're wandering through your garden. So look for those clues. Rabbits can be excluded using just a very low fence. You can even step over it. It doesn't need to be high at all. Um, if rabbits are your only issue. Deer, on the other hand, are a bit more of a challenge. Uh, deer can clear an eight foot fence. Um, I have an eight foot woven wire fence and it has kept deer out for uh, about 12 years. Um, but most folks don't wanna go that distance to install a big fence like that. Um, frankly, I would much rather look at a dazzling perennial inside a fence then uh, look at a chewed off stump that used to be a $20 prized hosta, but that's just my opinion. Um, I have three acres of plants, including the ever tasty Asiatic lilies and a lot of hostas. I live across from a DNR wildlife management area. I have a lot of deer pressure. Here's what works for me. I kind of know the entry points for the deer where they come into my property. So every spring I buy a bottle of liquid fence. It's a putrescent egg solid base. And I apply that even before the leaves are on any of the shrubs, trees, right at those entry points. And I do that because deer are stressed in the early spring and they're gonna start walking and trying to find um, easy, easy food to get them through over the hump until things green up. Um, so right away, they're gonna encounter some really bad tasting plants in my yard. Once I use that bottle up, I keep the bottle and I mix up my own homemade remedy. And this was actually used by my parents on their tree farm for 30 years. And it works pretty well for me. What works for me may not work for you, but this works really well on my property. I take an empty gallon milk jug, rinse it out. I fill it with three beaten eggs, a tablespoon of Dawn, and I fill it up with water. I keep it in the fridge in the garage and I use it to fill up that empty liquid fence bottle as my deer spray bottle. 
those bottles have really great nozzles on them and it'll allow that little bit of egg to easily go through and never plugs up. So I just keep the bottle and use it for that purpose. And it works for me. Um, the, the other little thing I do is I have a little shallow tray in the evening. I'll just throw a cup of shelled corn in it. And the rabbits would happily feed on a little shelled corn at night than eating really crappy tasting hostas. And it's worked for me for 10 years. I haven't had anything touch a hosta in my yard. A quick note about live trapping nuisance animals. It's not a very effective method. It's illegal to dump an animal on public land and it's often a death sentence for that animal. Or in the case of raccoons, I know folks have tried trapping raccoons when they're growing sweet corn. So the raccoons could sense the day before you're gonna harvest sweet corn and they'll hit the patch. Um, raccoons will probably beat you back home. They can travel up to 10 miles each night and they have a very strong homing instinct. So fencing might be a better option for you. And at the end of all this, some plants will grow back just fine as long as their roots are still untouched. So give them some protection and give them a little time and hopefully it'll work out. Plan for your next battle. Think about fencing, um, netting for your fruit trees to keep the birds away. Diatomaceous earth works well underneath your hostas preventing slug damage. Keep in mind repellents are not fences, they're psychological barriers. Um, but it might be best to start with the easy things first. You can always work your way up. And I have a lot of wire baskets that I use around particular plants that work great for keeping deer and rabbits away. And then think about replanting. Uh, shorter season crops will hopefully give you something you can enjoy this year before the deer come back. Peas, spinach, spices like basil and cilantro, lettuce, kale, bush beans, garlic, turnips, cauliflower, and good old radishes are excellent things to consider for um, replanting and still getting a crop from them this year. Hopefully when you installed your garden early this year, um, seeds went in a straight row, you marked each end of those rows so you can really keep track of what seeds are coming in, which plants are growing. Uh, really helps with weed management. This is the string method, by the way, just a couple of easy points, draw a string and you can put your seeds right underneath that. And then of course, remember to mark the ends of the row. Pull weeds before they flower and set seed. Um, so get out there early, just as the weeds start coming in. Can you spot in this slide where the row of vegetables actually is? Right at the top of the slide, it looks like there's some cabbage or broccoli perhaps coming in. So you wanna pull the weeds just on the outside of uh, the line of vegetables and then mulch around those plants, grass clippings, hay, straw, leaves, whatever you have to suppress any further weed growth. All soils in Minnesota contain weed seeds and they can spread by a lot of different sources. Competition from weeds makes it difficult for plants to get enough nutrient sunlight and sunlight. So it's important to really stay on top of the weed situation. For my perennial beds, um, I just do a little hand pulling. And like I say, I kind of walk around the yard every morning with with a hoe and just kind of nip at things here and there and, and catch them before they get too big. Um, tilling uh, will even out soil beds. It, it helps turn and warm the soil in the spring. It's great for working in amendments in your soil in the spring um, and managing weeds, but it can disrupt the soil's microbes and it can bring a gazillion different dormant <laughs> seeds up into the sunlight. Um, so if you are tilling, make sure you mulch right after to suppress any weed growth. I wet my plants. I didn't write that. I just got that this morning, by the way. Very clever. I work at a greenhouse. And one thing we have to kind of train the, the kids that come into work every, every year is, is watering plants. Because you will look out the window and we'll see them standing with the watering wand three feet above the plants, um, not getting very much water actually on the dirt. You want to water the dirt. Get that 
get that water source right down onto the soil and not on the plant. And if you're watering by hand, use a very slow flow so that you can really get a lot of water concentrated on those roots. Watering in the evening gives plants a chance to absorb it a bit during the overnight hours, but again, be careful. Water the soil, not the plant itself. So we've come to midsummer and now things are starting to get a little tall and rangy and spreading out all over. So it's time to stake them up and train some of your climbing plants. Um, you don't need to use a lot of fancy things. Um, it really allows your inner design engineer to come out and making these different structures to, to hold your plants up. But any type of cage or trellis is fine as long as it gets the job done. Um, a little pro tip, be aware of the height of your plants. How tall are they going to be before, before you decide it needs a cage? I more than once, probably even last year, forgot to put the tomato cage over the tomatoes when I planted them. And before I knew it, I'm trying to stuff a tomato into a tomato cage. It's not pretty. So it happens to all of us. Um, and I use a lot of twine and even just long tree branches that come down in storms to stake my taller plants. I have a chunk of old volleyball net that gives my morning glory something to climb on. And I use cheap tomato cages rather than the really fancy peony cages for my small to medium peonies and they work great. Pruning, thinning and pinching are uh, common activities at this part of the season. Um, it helps control the size of your plants. Um, tomatoes require a lot of pruning, especially to remove the suckers. That top photo shows a sucker um, emerging from a joint in the branches of your tomato plant. That is not going to produce any tomatoes, but it's going to take a lot of energy away from the plant. So every week or so, I kind of go over mine and make sure those suckers get pinched out. Um, it also forces plants to regrow any lost stems rather than gaining height and getting really leggy. You can also use this for helping train plants uh, to climb on a trellis, like cucumbers, squash, other vining plants can go on on trellises. So you can use vertical space rather than horizontal space in your garden. It also helps improve air and light flow, which lessens the potential for pests and diseases. So for example, thinning carrots and lettuce, especially if they weren't spaced out well in the beginning, now's a good time to do that. Um, I deadhead and save my zinnia flowers every year. I dry them and crush them up in paper grocery bags, store them in the winter in my garage. And then in the spring, when I'm in a really hurry and a million things to do, I spread generous globs of this zinnia hay in, into the rows. And then as they come in, that's when I go in and thin them out. Um, I just have a little more time then and uh, it works out really well for me. I haven't bought zinnia seed in years. I just kind of keep reusing the seeds from the plants every year. These activities can also help improve the quality and the size of your harvest. If you have herbs um, like basil, tarragon, thyme, sage, they'll produce more of their desired leaves if you keep up with pinching and pruning. It also forces the plants to regrow lost stems rather than gaining height. Uh, petunias are another example of an annual flower that really benefits from continually pinching them back. It keeps a nice full shape to the plant throughout the growing season. So in summary, um, a few of the things that we just finished talking about, um, staying ahead of weed prevention with mulching, keeping all your tools and sites clean, um, making sure that you're watering correctly, thinning your plants, staking them for support, and also keeping a notebook um, of things that you need to do down the road that you're gonna need a reminder for. Um, and I've also been impressed when people bring in their plant tags, they save all of them. And when they have questions about them or are looking to expand their design or their beds, they can say, this is what I have at home I'm working with. It's really helpful. And um, more than anything else, it's just good to enjoy the garden. It's uh, a wonderful activity and we hope you find it is as well. 
Our fourth and final webinar in the series will feature garden bloopers, a few triumphs we had this year, but a lot of crazy, weird, and unexpected garden things that happened to us, and we're happy to share those with you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Happy gardening. Soil tested this year. Is that okay? I know that was a recommendation right off the bat, but. You can have a soil test done anytime and uh, not essential if you didn't get around to doing it earlier this year. Um, some things you might wanna do to compensate for that, um, just following instructions on, on fertilizer products, spreading a good 10, 10, 10, um, at the adequate rate around your garden would certainly give you some benefit. Um, and uh, top dressing with finished compost is helpful. I do that with a lot of my perennials every year rather than doing a lot of fertilizing directly, but just the compost seems to keep them very happy. So those are a couple of things to do. Um, but again, you get a lot of great information on the test and you'll, you'll really enjoy receiving uh, that document and all the information you'll learn um, so it is worth the time and it's really a minimal cost for what you get back. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and I think this question's good too. Jan, can you also explain a little bit about diatomaceous earth and what that is? I think I saw that on one of our slides about how to, you know, prevent against those critters and pests. Good question. Thank you for asking. Um, Diatomaceous earth is a, a granular mineral product that microscopically, it has very, very sharp edges. Slugs are ooey gooey things. And when they slither over the diatomaceous earth, it cuts them into little shreds and then you don't have any more slugs. It's inexpensive, it's easy to find. Garden centers, feed stores will carry it. Um, so it's a good product to use and environmentally safe to use. Can you tell I'm not a fan of slugs? I don't like slugs. <laughs> I really hate slugs. What does this earth, diatomaceous earth look like? Is it granules? I think um, it almost kind of looks like really finely ground eggshells. Okay, because I've got a bag of oyster shells in my garage that I heard you're supposed to chop up and I have slugs in my hostess. I don't know why. I think it's because of, I use bark for mulch. <clears throat> it's just really moist in there. Hmm. But I've tried everything. I've tried the copper rings. Don't waste your money on it. But <laughs> yeah. What about sluggo? Have you I, tried sluggo? I have tried sluggo. Uh, I still get them, but hmm. I haven't tried this other thing. I hate them. They're gross. They're ooh. <laughs> you know. Um, I use just leaf mulch, oak leaf mulch. I don't actually bring in any other type of mulch amendment around mine. And I've, I've never had a slug issue on my hostas. So it must work similar to the oyster shells. The I think so, yeah. They just don't want to go across. Uh, crushed eggshells are actually another... another uh, material you can use. If you want to save all your eggshells and dry them out and then grind them up and spread them out in your yard, there's something that'll keep you busy. But diatomaceous earth is inexpensive and probably a lot easier right. than making your own. Right. Well, I, have a, I have a question. I mean, what, what do you mean by pinching? A plant. Cutting, right? I mean, I understand, you know, pruning, I think, but what do you mean by pinching? Pinching requires no tools whatsoever, just pinching. So when things start to get a little leggy, um, I want to just pinch off as I'm walking by. And it just tightens up the habit or the shape of the plant. Um, it can also force more branching to come out so it just doesn't get so tall and spindly. So anytime you're pinching at a plant, the plant is going to put more energy into that area and 
send out more branching. So it's a good thing to do the pruning and pinching and those kind of things because it's signaling to the plant um, that it needs to grow more in that area. And um, like I say, we talked a little bit about with pinching with the tomatoes um, and the petunias and things like that, but especially even with the annuals, just always pinching. Deadheading is another thing I consider pinching off all the dead blooms. And again, that's gonna invigorate the plant. It needs to send out more seeds, make more seeds, make more flowers. I have one more, I have another question actually. How do you, how do you go about planning your garden? How do you figure out where you're gonna plant and what, where you're gonna plant and what you're gonna plant there? It's always interesting watching customers come in and buying vegetable plants in the spring. Um, Sheila's probably seen this quite a lot. People go a little, a little crazy. Um, I think they always overbuy because um, they pick a lot of things that they like, which is good. First, plant and grow what you're going to eat, right? Um, so that's the first one. Pick easy plants to grow if you're an inexperienced. Start small. Um, don't buy every vegetable plant in the store. <laughs> Let's start small with easy plants. And you can find a lot of tools online as far as how to do garden planning. Um, full sun, have access to water, um, are both very important as well. And, um, and watch our first webinar. We'll tell you everything you need to know in that first webinar. When I planted my beans this summer or spring, um, most, a lot of my beans didn't come up. And what would cause that? Well, it could have been that you had um, seeds that weren't viable. Um, sometimes if I have seed packets that are unopened in my seed bin every year that I were from previous years, I'll put a few on a wet paper towel and just see what the viability is of the seeds before, before I actually go and put them in the garden. Um, so you might have had some bad seed. Um, but there certainly is time, it's a, it's a short season crop, so there's certainly time that you can do a replant and um, try using a different seed source and hopefully you'll have better results. Okay, thank you. I'll ask a general question. If you're using a hoe in your garden, how close can you get to the plants to get those weeds? That's a very good question. I have two different types of hose that I use and a lot of folks have their favorite style that they use. Um, but I use one to get as close to the row as I can. That's a, a hoe that's kind of in a trying a point. And that one I can feather really close to the plants um, without hurting the roots of the seedlings. Um, but there are tools that also have kind of a claw at the end that work really well. You can get fairly close. But sometimes you just have to get in and hand weed things that might have popped up really close to the seedlings. Um, it's too easy to catch the roots if you get too close with the hose. <laughs> 